Good morning, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. to be here. Good morning. It started in just a moment. If you have any questions, just add them to the chat and I'll try to get to them before the end of today's live stream. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, Sunnyvale. Happy November. Uh, welcome to my weekly virtual office hours. You know, this week's background, uh, for, uh, ultimately mural, for pretty much a piece of art, uh, is from one at Charles Street Gardens. So I thought it was actually an interesting sort of design uh, to talk about, you know, to basically highlight some of the artwork that's it's at Charles Street Gardens, uh, and it's they have chickens there if you haven't been. Uh, and this was from my visit there earlier uh, last month when uh, they had their fall garden sale. So they're basically, you know, depending upon the seasons, they sell uh, seedlings for your fall garden or fall winter garden right now. And then uh, in the springtime, they do their, their spring summer garden. So uh, if you get a chance, definitely it's always worth a visit. Um, it's been around for, for a good number of years now and always happy to, you know, as one of the founding members there and happy to, to visit and see how that, you know, continues to develop in that community that's really grown there. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning. I'm Sunnyvale Mayor Larry Klein. Thank you for joining me again this week. This is the 138th. Uh, installment of my weekly virtual office hours. You know, welcome to November. I hope everyone is staying well. I've had uh, my own issues, as you know. Uh, I hope you know. Um, last week we we actually had to cancel uh, my virtual office hours, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but back, and I'm up and around, and and ready to talk to people. Um, but we've now reached 970 days since the March 16, 2020 county, county health order started the shelter in place in an attempt to slow the spread of COVID-19. You know, over two years ago, I converted my weekly coffee shop office hours into this weekly live stream address. And, you know, until last week's surgery, I hadn't missed a week. Uh, but people still say they really appreciate hearing from the mayor each week, whether or not they're watching it live or watching it video delayed. Um, but these weekly addresses, you know, are good for me because they allow me to take stock over the last few weeks. Um, they allow you, uh, me to, you know, provide you updates on what's happening in the city, you know, give you some um, answer some of your questions and just give you some general words of encouragement. So thanks for allowing me to continue to represent you. Uh, and work for Sunnyvale however I can. You know, most Fridays, just like today, I follow up this live stream address with in-person 
uh, meetings on being seen at being seen on Murphy Avenue. So just email me if you'd like to reserve a 15 minute or 30 minute time slot, and I'm sure we can make something work. You know, I'm also intermittently changing my background art with art provided by artists from the Senegal Art Club. Today's piece was provided by Andrea Gatura, and you know, I was trying to change it up, but. Um, uh, with my limited mobility right now, I thought it was just easier to leave it there the, again uh, this week. But this is a um, Andrea Katura's Hot Pants. Uh, so if you're interested in this piece or similar pieces, just want to, you know, connect with the artist, you know, just reach out to me and I'll put you in contact with the artist. So let's go ahead and get started talking about what's happened to federal, state, county and city level over the last two weeks. Uh, you know, two weekends ago, uh, we had our Halloween pet parade in downtown. So, you know, it was great to have so many people and pets, of course, dressed up to celebrate, you know, Halloween and be part of the parade. Uh, and then, of course, in the afternoon, the downtown businesses actually did a trick or treat event for the first time. But we had uh, over, I think, close to 400 participants in the parade. So it gets better every year especially post-COVID people really wanted to be in person and, and it was great to see people. And then we had lots of events happening at uh, Plaza del Sol uh, after the event. So we, there was, of course, you know, competitions from a uh, competitions from uh, what the pet, what the pets and the families were, were dressed as. Uh, but then of course there were some uh, contra or, or there's also a competition on pet tricks. So that, that actually worked out fairly well. Uh, and then uh, different booze there uh, that were selling different items. And so I was happy to see that that event continues to grow from just the number of people being part of it, as well as, you know, adding different, different things there at the end. And, and then of course, you know, actually be able to have, um, a pet parade or not, not just the pet parade, but then, you know, trick or treating during the day along Murphy, along Murphy Avenue. I think it was really a, a nice addition this year. So thanks to the chamber and all the different sponsors that really made that possible. Last Tuesday, uh, council met and we started with a study study session on an update for the Sunnyvale Clean Water Program. And so, you know, this was a, a discussion of our continual update, and it's the the biggest the biggest project in the histories in the history of our city. Uh, but it's basically redoing the wastewater treatment plant that was uh, put in in the fifties. And you know, updating it for modern technology, additional capacity, all of that, all while keeping it going, which is which is always the interesting thing. Uh, but but it was good to hear that update. And then, as far as the main meeting, we declared the Saturday after Thanksgiving is Small Business Saturday, so we're in that holiday season. Uh, and so, definitely, always shop local when you can. It's better for our local businesses as well as, of course. Uh, uh, you know, from a from a city standpoint, we get more sales tax dollar, dollars if if things are if, the, if things are purchased within the city, of course. And we honored Walt's Bicycle as you know highlighted them as a local business. So especially if you're in for any bicycle items, um, any you know uh, looking at an e bike, definitely you know drop by Walt's uh, Bicycles. It's been around for. Um, for I think uh, 60 years, if I remember correctly, but uh, ultimately, yeah, it's right there at Evelyn on Evelyn and Carroll Avenue, if you haven't been. We also declared November as Picture Book Month, and one of the librarians actually uh, wrote, a, a, wrote a rhyme uh, presentation on that, and so uh, it's always good. You know, those are some of the most used, picture books are some of the most used books in the library because, you know, so many, so many of our, you know, youth, so, so many kids, so many parents want to read to their children, and so it actually, it, um, it's, it's part of our, you know, most ever-changing collection as far as the library is concerned. Um, and then we awarded, uh, or then we, um, let's see, we had, um, what was it? Um, we approved a list of priorities from a federal, um, from federal alloc allocations and supplemental city funding for, you know, what we're doing uh, 
from a priority needs um, assessment. So we actually have you know, a needs assessment that's done every few years, and then it prioritizes where we'll be spending federal funds as well as city funds on you know very low income extremely low you know special needs housing you know housing for seniors um, disabled people children youth victims of domestic violence and then kind of laid out what those priority needs are of course basic needs you know food shelter transportation health health care you know employment assistance child care kind of the first tier and then you know after school and intervention programs you know mental health yeah all, all those are kind of defined so this is kind of setting setting um in uh, place what those priorities are and then when we have those monies to to dole out you know on a yearly basis then we get applications from the different service agencies that you know want to start a certain program or are doing good in our city and are looking to get funding uh, supplemental funding to make sure that they continue those programs and then um, as far as last week's meeting we also approve studying to general planned amendments. So we initiate, you know, general planned amendments to our zoning. Um, whenever a developer comes in, whenever, you know, a, 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 a site owner comes in and says they'd like to do that, now we try to bundle those up as much as possible. Uh, but there were two that went through, one of which was on Knickerbocker, and it's considering changing the general plan from commercial uh, to high density residential on a one acre site uh, just south of El Camino. And then, <clears throat> and then the second one is looking at the California Avenue, what we'll call Walmart Lab site. Uh, so that's the that's the site that's on the south south side of California, right near the fire station. Uh, and it was to evaluate at, at basically going from only commercial to mixed use, so basically commercial, you know, office space as well as housing, and um, ultimately we'll be studying up to um, 1,027 units of housing, um, and then increasing the amount of office industrial in that area, maintaining, of course, the Libby's Tower, this is that iconic, iconic portion of that location, but it's about, um, it's about 30 acres uh, completely uh, for from Matilda, you know, from Matilda going all the way west um, to the to where there's already condos and apartments. So, so you know, it's ultimately kind of changing that those land uses and and nothing is um, in stone as far as that's concerned. You know, ultimately what we're doing is uh, looking at what the impacts would be, what what makes sense as far as density. You know, so taking a look all at all those um, in from a holistic standpoint and then going through and studying that. And then we also approved a policy change allowing our public safety department to increase the number of drones that they have from two to three. Uh, right now, you know, the two drones that they have are more for outdoor, um, you know, high, high search and rescue. Uh, when there's an accident at a large intersection, it's getting photos from a higher, from a higher standpoint. You know, we used to have to bring in fire trucks to actually do that. So we bring in a fire truck to and extend the ladder so that people could get photos above a, an accident scene. And now it's much easier with drones. Um, but we didn't have, we have, you know, one of the things that we're looking to do is add a drone, a smaller drone that can go easily within buildings. So if we have somebody, you know, basically barricaded in a building, we can send the drone in um, to figure out what's going on and, and, and also have better communication. So that drone could then um, have directly communicate. So if they're not answering their phone or their cell phone, uh, we can actually you know, have that localized communication on via that drone. So, so we approved that increase from a policy standpoint. And if you ever wonder about, you know, one of the things that council does, one of the biggest things is set policies and define what those policies are. And so in this case, it's like part of the drone policy for, from DPS is to document every time the drone is being used. So if you go to the, the public safety portion of the website, you can actually see uh, what is going on from from how often we use our drone over the last few years and what we used it for. Um, and then as far as um, 
And I think that was it for that meeting. Uh, but then the following night, we actually had a second meeting. So Wednesday evening, we had a special meeting. We did some interviews for our boards and commissions. And then we also had a study session to discuss possible local firearm regulations. So we had had a study session earlier this year and kind of narrowed down a wider range of choices to uh, three choices to talk about. And so staff went off and did an um, investigation, a deeper dive on all those um, and ultimately, we did. Um, we were talking about having either mandatory gun owner liability insurance, um, a definition of sensitive places on you know where concealed carry weapon holders couldn't uh, couldn't have a weapon. And you know there was a state bill last year that failed by just two votes to get emergency passage. And then the last thing um, was prohibiting the licensed gun dealers from releasing firearms until the Department of Justice completes a buyer's background check. So, you know, and that actually has a very, very small percentage of firearms that met this requirement. The, the Department of Justice normally completes the buyer's background checks within the 30-day requirement. So you're talking about, you know, this, this very small, I think 1% is where, um, you know, they don't meet, um, they ultimately issue a gun that they shouldn't have issued. So, or, you know, it's, it's far less, it's it's in the noise to some degree. But, you know, also ultimately council talked about, you know, kind of all three ordinances, the, the um, gun owner liability insurance is normally from what we found out is normally just being covered. Um, the changing that law doesn't really change that much because it's covered by uh, most people's umbrella law for or umbrella uh, insurance for their homes. So, so ultimately, you know, it wasn't a big change, and and ultimately, it's currently going through um, going through the court systems. You know, it's it's being appealed and all this other stuff, and and just to jump in because it wouldn't be able to go in until you know these appeals are actually going through most likely. Um, we decided to hold off on that one. We did define, you know, we did say we want to move forward with what sensitive places are where concealed weapon carrier, carrier um, concealed carry weapon holders uh, wouldn't be able to have weapons. So, you know, whether or not that's churches or parks or whatever, we kind of gave, we kind of duplicated what that state bill that didn't pass earlier this year would be from, from a city standpoint. And so that's one of the things that, that the Supreme Court said that we can do is define what um, sensitive places are. And so that's one of the things that we'll be bringing back in December. Um, and, and we had a good discussion, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I really enjoyed was um, and one of the things I, I'm, I'm happy that public safety has been able to do is kick off a, a child safe, basically a gun lock program. So if you know of anyone uh, with a um, with a gun lock or with a gun and needs a gun lock, and that's part of, you know, that's part of the law is everyone should have a gun lock. Or you should either be locked away or should have basically uh, a lock around um, a trigger to make sure that they, they cannot be fired unless the, the lock is removed. If you know of anyone in the city that has that, that has a gun and needs a lock, you know, trying to prevent accidental or suicides, uh, accidental shootings or suicides, because the number of kids around the country that are that are um, shot and or killed every year because of uh, playing around with a gun that their parents might have, you know, that to me is something that is the most preventable and, and will make a really big difference from, from a gun standpoint. So, you know, uh, I was able to, to work with a nonprofit and now the public safety is working with that nonprofit called Child Safe. And they're giving out free gun locks. And so it's it's been on the social media. I've publicized it, but but I do think, you know, it's it's programs like that that really make a difference in cities. And and you know, I'm I'm happy that public safety has is committed to handing those out. So so you know, it's it's a great program, uh, definitely worth you know publicizing as much as you can. Um, and then so that was Wednesday evening. Uh, and then early Thursday, I was off at Stanford to um, have surgery. So I had rotator cuff surgery. Um, I had a um, 
I injured myself about five weeks ago uh, out walking the dog and uh, ultimately uh, tore my rotator cuff and so had been barely able to raise my right arm above my head for for several weeks. Um, and, but once the, you know, so went through an MRI, you know, once the, once the doctor got in there, uh, he's like, he saw all kinds of old scar tissue from, you know, uh, sports when I was, when I was younger, but ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm on the mend. Um, I'm, you know, had, had surgery all day Thursday. And on Friday, I thought I would actually be able to, do a live stream, uh, at least a short one, but I decided to take the week off. I wasn't feeling the best um, Friday morning. And I, and I want to thank everybody for all the well wishes. You know, I have, I've had, you know, several cards and, and lots of people, you know, reaching out through email and, and social media, uh, wishing me um, good on my recovery. And so far, you know, so far I'm getting better. You know, it's, the pain was a little bad over the weekend, but but ultimately, you know, I I will be entering physical therapy sometime over the next month, and uh, hopefully we'll be back to 100% sometime next year. Uh, and then, as far as last weekend is concerned, uh, Sunnyvale Community Service volunteers had their annual holiday craft fair and bake sale at Murphy Park. And it was actually, you know, very well attended. You know, I dropped by for a short period of time and picked, you know, picked up some things, got got a head start on the, the holiday shopping. Uh, but it was actually, you know, a lot of fun to see people in person, even though I was um, still in a lot of pain, but uh, happy, happy to be out there and support, you know, Sunnyvale Community Services. All the all the money raised from that goes to Sunnyvale Community Services. So it's always a good, you know, fundraising thing every year. <clears throat> and then Tuesday of this week. Um, so this week was relatively slow, uh, not that much happening. Uh, but Tuesday, of course, was election day. And, you know, the news has been filled with the national, state, you know, local elections ever since. Um, you know, I'll skip, you know, um, well, actually, let, let me go through some of the, the races that affect us. And I'll skip over the national elections, which kind of affect everybody. But I think it will be weeks before, you know, the national elections are settled to a certain degree. But from a state standpoint, um, the seated Democrats all won um, their state offices. So, so you know, from, from a state level, you know, all the, all the people that are running for re-election, the governor, the lieutenant governor, all, all that, you know, ended up winning re-election. And then as far as the state propositions, it was pretty much, uh, I think it was completely along the the suggested voting that I was talking about a few weeks ago. Uh, but, you know, uh, Proposition 1 passed, you know, it's a constitutional right for reproductive fr freedom um, as a constitutional amendment. And that passed with about two thirds of the voters. Uh, but, you know, it's, it just reaffirmed the importance of, a, of women's reproductive rights, which I think was critical. Uh, props 26 and 27 uh, failed, and those were the online gambling ones um, with, you know, minor carve outs for Indian casinos and other things. But, you know, I think ultimately people saw that that there's a lot of special interest as far as that's concerned. Uh, Prop 28 passed. I was happy to see that go. You know, that was providing additional funding for arts and music education in public schools. And so that kind of forces the state to make sure it set, sets aside money for art and music, which I think is critical. Uh, Prop 29 failed. And this is the on, you know, the on-site licensed medical profession professional at kidney dialysis clinics that we get pretty much every two years, it seems like. So that failed yet again. Uh, Prop 30 failed, uh, a little bit closer, but but ultimately that was the, the EV conversion or converting more to EVs faster um, that was really funded uh, by Lyft. So they were the um, Lyft uh, wants all of their drivers to drive, you know, EVs or as, as soon as possible and want it paid for for via state programs as much as possible because they're, you know, Lyft and Uber are defined that they have to have all of their drivers driving um, EVs 
by 2030. And so this was one way for them to look at look at um, trying to move that forward faster. But um, oh, hang on, yeah, and, yeah, and that, and so um, ultimately um, that you know that failed uh ultimately and it was it was mixed it was interesting to see who was on either side but the governor came out against it um there are a lot of people that were that wanted it to pass you know tax the millionaires um and fund and help fund that but ultimately um that failed uh and then prop 31 passed and so that was the referendum on um prohibiting the sale of certain flavored tobacco products. And, you know, in 2020, Sunnyvale passed that ordinance, um, you know, and so we were able to do it at a local level. And here it was finally moved to the state um, standpoint. But when the state tried to do it, then there was a referendum to fight it. And until the referendum passed or failed, um, the state couldn't, you know, the, ultimately the state law couldn't go into effect. And so now, you know, the state, um, the state law, as far as, uh, prohibiting the retail of, of certain tobacco products, flavored tobacco products are, is now, you know, is now complete. Um, and so that's it from the proposition standpoint. Um, I'll probably talk a little bit more about that next week. Um, but as for our state representation at a local level, uh, Evan Lowe is our new state assembly member. You know, I've been working with Evan for years, so this is good for Sunnyvale. You know, I think, you know, his his dad lives here and he's, you know, he he knows a lot about Sunnyvale, even though he didn't represent um, this district. You know, Sunnyvale was not part of his district, but as, as redistricting happened, you know, um, Mark Berman and... Uh, Evan, and, sorry, Mark Berman as our assembly member and Josh Becker as our state senator. Uh, their districts changed and Sunnyvale was no longer part of their district. So there was a new district and that's where Evan, you know, decided to move to and run because his old district had two assembly members. He lived in Campbell and he would have had to run against Mark Berman. But, you know, Evan's already um, helped, um, has been helping you know, has helped me for years as far as how to work with some, some of the state bills and give me advice from that standpoint. But the other half of that is he's already stepping up and, and working for Sunnyvale. So, you know, we ultimately uh, worked with the San Jose Water uh, Company earlier this week, and, and they had money to donate to some of the service organizations. Um, and he made sure that that Sunnyvale Community Services ended up getting some of that, some of those gift certificates for the Thanksgiving dinner. So, so it was good uh, gift cards for Thanksgiving dinner. So I'll I'll, I'll post about that um, sometime sometime soon. But but it's actually good from that standpoint, and happy that Evan Evan is our new assembly member. And then as far as our state senate, senator, uh, that race is still close to call. You know, Lily May, uh, Fremont mayor, is still leading Aisha Wahab, one of the council members from Hayward. Uh, and so, you know, every update, the, those numbers stay about the same, you know, a thousand, a thousand votes ahead. So we'll see where that goes. But um, ultimately, that's most likely the way that goes, but you know it's still still a lot of uncounted votes uh, as far as the election is concerned. And then as far as Sunnyvale district elections, you know as I said months ago, we canceled the district one election, and that's um, the southwest Sunnyvale portion. You know, so Linda Sell was the only qualified person who had filled out all the paperwork uh, at the at the end of that qualification period. And so we ended up saving the city, you know, twenty thousand dollars or so, um, just over twenty thousand. Uh, but she's, you know, so and she's actually been walking, walking her districts in or walking her the neighborhoods in her district. And so I really appreciate that, you know, reaching out to those people that that might not have heard about her. And so that's actually been very good as far as district three. And so that is the South Central uh, district. Um, it's too close to call. It's between Justin Wang and Murley Srinivasan. And they have a fairly equal number of votes. Um, less than 50 votes currently separate them. Um, as the county register keeps counting votes um, that are that were in the mail. And so so on the election night, they finish, you know, the majority of the in-person voting on that day and any anything that they had pre-election day that they had processed 
but they have lots of last minute votes that are, you know, that are mailed in, received that day. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, they, they have to open up all those, they have to check all the signatures, they go through all that process um, prior to, uh, you know, so that's, that's the thousands of votes that continue to get counted um, around, you know, around the state, around the country, uh, especially with mail-in, you know, it only had to be postmarked by, you know, November 8th. And then, you know, it still has to go through some, some, you know, ballots are still going through the mail. So we'll see how all those elections go. Um, and then as far as District 5, which is basically the Caltrain tracks to 101, um, Richard Mellinger ended up taking that district. So I've been working with Richard for, for many years now. He's been on our BPAC. And so um, he, he, you know, he won that, so he won that district. And so we will finish our district transitions in January. You know, the, the Register of Voters has 30 days to basically certify the election. So, so November 6th, I think is the, is the date um, when they should, or sorry, December 6th is when they should be certifying the, the elections. And then we will do the final transition, the first meeting in January of you know, the outgoing, we have three outgoing council members and three incoming district council members. So that's what you have to look forward to. And then as far as, uh, so that was Tuesday. And then, you know, lots of election night parties. I was out late that evening um, visiting different, you know, different people uh, and they're, you know, having election night parties uh, around our city, around the county. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we had Wednesday morning, we had uh, very early uh, at 9 a.m., we had our ribbon cutting ceremony for the Fair Oaks Bridge. And so this is the renovation that's been going on for the last two years. Lots of issues along the way from from jurisdictional, you know, scheduling issues with Caltrain uh, to migra migratory foul, you know, there. So and of course, there was, you know, the pandemic there's always there were you know lots more issues than what we expected initially but but you know we finally finished that renovation um just a, uh, in the last month or two you know and it, the biggest thing was ensuring that the bridge and the foundation are structurally and seismically sound you know so that was i think our third bridge that we've done over the last few years to improve you know seismically and structural and its structural uh capabilities and we also actually added some other safety, you know, improvements. Uh, so enhance the intersections at Kiefer in Fair Oaks and Evelyn in Fair Oaks. So that was, you know, that was part of that, how the how those intersections were. You improve the alignment of Hendy Avenue that goes underneath the bridge. So if you if you're going to Home Depot uh, or coming in from that direction, you can kind of see what's been changed from the road there. And then, of course, there's wider bike lanes and, you know, a new pedestrian sidewalk along the east side of the bridge that took the place of, I'll say, the old uh, kind of pedestrian pedestrian bridge that was there near Home Depot that that had quite a few issues over the years. And I don't know how ADA compliant it was when it was first built, but, but definitely had a certain number of issues. Uh, and so that was Wednesday. Uh, and then, of course, today is Veterans Day. So, you know, there'll be multiple parades around the county to honor those that served our nation. So definitely, if you know someone who served, please thank them for their service today. Um, and let's go ahead and get to our COVID numbers. Uh, you know, COVID numbers across the nation continue to trend downward. You know, from a national standpoint, we've reached 97.6 million cases. That increased um, about 300,000 in the last two weeks. Uh, nationally, we've had over 225 million um, fully vaccinated. That's about two thirds of our population and 49% have received their boosters. More than 84% of those five and older um, have at least one dose and nationally 78% of adults are fully vaccinated. So all those are good. Uh, we still have people passing away with de uh, be be with COVID. You know, we've had about 2,000 in the last two weeks. Uh, so we now have 1,068,000 people that have passed away with COVID. And from a California standpoint, you know, we've 
uh, still have COVID cases ticked upwards a little bit. We've had 10 million 542 uh, positive cases, and we've seen a continual drop on the average um, in general. Um, the, the new case rate is at 2,800 new cases a day. That's up from 2,500 two weeks ago, but it's still down from 3,000 a day, um, 3,300 a day about a month ago. So, so we, we're, you know, we're kind of leveled out and uh, trending downward, but, you know, our case positivity rate um, is at 5.3%. Uh, it was at 4.1%. So, so that average is, is ticking upward slightly. We've had another 300 deaths because of COVID. So we're at 96 thousand deaths within um within California and then from a county standpoint our our you know case rates still you know look relatively good you know we've had about 440,000 people um with that have been tested positive with covid um we've had 2513 deaths that's um nine additional deaths in the last two weeks you know more than 95% of those 18 and older are fully vaccinated and just a touch under seventy percent of those that set under seventy percent of those that are eligible for the booster have already received it. So, you know, I continue to spend lots of time advocating on our city's behalf at the state level, at the county level, talking to county health, talking to our county supervisors. You know, as far as testing, you know, COVID testing is uh, happening at the community center at on the first and third. Uh, Thursdays of the month, so they will be back here next Thursday on the 17th, and then, uh, and if you want to reserve a spot, you can just go to secfreetest.org to reserve a spot um, to get tested, and then if you need to get the vac vaccinated within the county, you can go to secfreevax.org. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, announce some of the upcoming events, so this is a very busy season to say the least. Um, next Tuesday, there will be a vigil, uh, basically a solidarity vigil against hate. And so, you know, this is this is an ongoing, you know, a national united against hate um, event that's happening around the country uh, next week. So uh, what we what we're doing from a city standpoint is having a vigil at the Sunnyvale Community Center at that upper fountain. Um, we're basically, we just will be reaffirming Sunnyvale's commitment um, to unity. Um, and just it, to me, I think it's really good, you know, so it's a candlelight vigil, you know, it'll be a stand against racism, bigotry, ignorance, you know, our, our you know, the diversity of our city is one of our strengths. And, and for me, you know, I think it's, it's great to bring people together, you know, the city will be providing candles um, and posters, or you can bring your own. So definitely come by if you can if you get a chance. But that'll be happening from 6:30 p.m. to 7:30 p.m. next Tuesday. That'll be November 15th. Um, and if you need more information, you can go to sunnyvale.ca.gov/unity, and I'll be publicizing that on the website. And then uh, other upcoming events: uh, the Sunnyvale Friends of the Library will have their book sale next the the following weekend. So um, November 19th and 20th uh, with the, you know, books, the standard book sale all weekend and then the $5 bag sale on Sunday. And then on Sunday, November 20th, um, that, that following that Sunday, uh, Pints of Joy will be actually be having their grand opening celebration at their new location on El Camino Real. Uh, so they're, they have, so they're currently located and it's great to see this home business that's, that's continued to expand in Sunnyvale. So they have a small store across from Fremont, um, Fremont High School right now. Uh, but that's a common kitchen and, and, you know, what they're do basically doing is creating their own, um, their own locate, their brand new location on El Camino. That's just, um, just east of, um, Fair Oaks, as far as I, as far as I remember, but that celebration will be happening on Sunday, November 20th. Um, and, you know, come by, have some ice cream. I've had it before, I've highlighted them before. So it's good to have that family, family business expanding in our city. And of course, Thanksgiving is less than two weeks away now. And so Thanksgiving morning uh, is the annual Silicon Valley turkey trot. 
So if you want to join me, I'll be there. You know, I'll probably be walking, but not running this year. Uh, you know, pack up, pick up is actually at the end of next week. So sign up now. Um, and, you know, if you want, uh, the, the pack up pickup is at Sports Basement Sunnyvale. It's right there on Kern Avenue um, at Lawrence. And if you sign up, you also get a discount to purchase at Sports Basement. So definitely, you know, consider uh, joining the fun. You know, this is an a the annual event and, you know, it's always good to get out um, on you know, well, first it raises money for our service organizations, but it's good out. It's good to be out, you know, Thanksgiving morning uh, with a lot of people and, you know, exercising. And then you feel a little bit less guilty for for having that turkey later in the day. And since we're talking about the holiday season, you know, let's go ahead and talk about some of the December events. You know, the 23rd annual holiday tree lighting celebration will be happening on December, um, December 3rd the first Saturday in December on uh, Murphy Avenue. And so we'll have the holiday tree lighting. Santa will be there as well as uh, carolers, qu uh, choirs, dance troops will be performing. Uh, there'll also be actually um, unveiling of the Sunnyvale Gingerbread Village. And, you know, we had our first ginger Sunnyvale Gingerbread Village last year. Uh, we'll be doing it again this year. You can, you know, if you want to make a gingerbread house for that gingerbread village, um, you can, um, and the, the big unveiling will happen that same night after the tree lighting. Uh, but it ultimately, it uh, will be, then be displayed at the Sunnyvale Public Library until the beginning of January. So if you want to submit your own gingerbread house, you have until Friday, December 2nd. And if you go to um, the city website and search for gingerbread, I think you'll, you'll be able to find that. And then that same uh, first Saturday evening at around 7.30 p.m., the Caltrain holiday train uh, will be arriving in downtown Sunnyvale. So it's actually great from that standpoint that, you know, we will light the tree and then, you know, an, an hour or two later, you have the Caltrain um, holiday lights and there's, you know, there's carolers, there's snow, uh, quote unquote snow, um, and there's music and and just what the, what they do to the Caltrain itself is just amazing. So so definitely if you get a chance to attend that, um, you know, definitely do. And then that same weekend, that first weekend in December, uh, Fremont High School Holiday Craft Fair will return for its 34th year. Um, and so there will be, you know, local vendors um, with items ranging from clothing to jewelry, cosmetic products, and a lot more. So that's right at the main gym of Fremont uh, High School. So that's Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 3 p.m. So if you want to add to your, if you weren't able to go to Sunnyvale Community Services Holiday Fair last weekend, then you have that chance coming up. And then as far as uh, upcoming council meetings, our next council meeting is the Thursday, is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll be considering amendment to the downtown specific plan for block 20. Um, so that's the old Macy's parking lot to allow more residential and retail commercial uses. So, so that will, you know, that will be discussed at that evening. We'll be proving temporary art um, in private development for, for city lines. So they have um, I think we, and I got a quick view of it when we opened up the last two pieces of art, you know, the, the fountain across from Whole Foods and the Thousand Sons uh, farther along McKinley. Uh, there was, they actually took out one of the, they brought out one of the uh, potential uh, new pieces of artwork and showed it at, you know, at that unveiling. So, uh, so that's one of the things that we're looking at. And then we'll also um, adopt a resolution establishing a human relations commission. So, so lots of things going on before the end of the year. You know, our December meetings are usually very long because uh, there's some things that we just need to get off the docket before the end of the year. So, so that's that's you know what we have coming up from a council standpoint. Uh, let's go ahead and get to our weekly questions. Uh, Selena asked, "Is there a calendar or Facebook group where you can find out about Sunnyvale events?" Um, and so you can always go to my calendar um, at LarryKlein.com, and I put all these events on that calendar so, so people can, you know, kind of go through 
uh, what that, you know, what events are coming up for the mayor, you know, so there's council meetings and you see when the council meetings are as well as, you know, like the Pints of Joy grand opening or the pet parade or, you know, the, the tree lighting, the Caltrain, you know, uh, the Caltrain holiday train. All those sorts of things end up on my on my calendar, so you can take a look there. Um, and then uh, I am going to restart my newsletter. You know, as people do seem to be interested as far as my, as polling is concerned, so I'll be I'll be putting that up sometime in the next week or so, so that people can get you know and then forward it to their friends when they see an event that's happening, and not just hearing from their mayor each week and going through this. Uh, Sharon asked, "When will Sunnyvale be updating its infrastructure to improve?" Our horrible internet, we had an ATT representative out recently to try to help us. He was shocked at the antiquated service. He said that there's nothing he can do until the city upgrades. So I hadn't heard this. You know, I'd heard that, you know, the private utilities, they utilize the private, the public right of way. And so underneath the streets, but that's their equipment. The city doesn't own any of that equipment. So I am following up with city staff on that. You know, a few years ago, we had, you know, Google saying that they were going to install fiber, um, but that never went to fruition. You know, they ended up uh, canceling those programs. So they had several cities that they were going to, to put fiber into, but that, you know, never, never completed. But let me check into it. Let me find out. But as far as I know, like the, you know, like the cell service on the poles, like the, like the, you know, fiber and, you know, um, uh, internet service, you know, that's all dependent upon the infrastructure that those, that those utilities pay for. So Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, you know, it's their responsibility. Um, and, you know, the city isn't in charge of that. The city isn't charging them for that. Um, John asked, why does it take, Oh, why does it take the city so hard to, why does the city make it so hard to put in heat pumps, you know, 50 dB at the property line and setback requirements, and they can't be seen from the streets. I want to go electric and these restrictions are unreasonable. Um, so uh, I'll beg to differ about the reason, the, the requirements being unreasonable. You know, these are, have nothing to do about going electric. These noise requirements are part of our noise ordinance to be a good neighbor. You know, a droning noise overnight would actually affect your neighbors. And, and so the 50 dB limit, you know, is what is part of that. You know, setbacks try to help with that. And then just visually, you know, uh, you can't see it from the street. Although I think if you put appropriate shielding around it, appropriate fencing around it, you can actually, you know, hide it from view and then it can actually be approved. Um, since we're in the holiday season, Sarah asked, does City Line Sunnyvale plan to bring back the winter ice rink this year? So with all of the construction that's happening downtown, um, definitely, you know, City Line has decided to put a hold on the ice rink as far as this year is concerned. Hopefully it will be back next year, they think. It depends on where construction stands for, for where, um, you know, the the downtown is for the city line projects but they're hoping to bring it back next year but we will have more information uh when we do that but but i've been talking to them as far as that's concerned janice asked when is the new city hall open so i toured you know city hall a few weeks ago and posted about that staff will be moving into city hall in january and we'll have some grand opening event early next year but that's upcoming and so we'll we'll figure that out uh, Eric asked, is Denny's still slated to reopen in the new residential building on Matilda? And so, yes, the old Denny's was replaced with a five-story building along Matilda with a lot shorter, you know, along Charles Avenue. But uh, there is a place for a restaurant there. And, you know, there's 75 apartments and underground parking. But currently, you know, tenant improvements should be starting uh, beginning sometime in the next month or two with the, they, that those should be completed by the spring of 2023. So the first half of 2023 sometime. Let me see if I had any questions that I can actually read uh, from a um, from a comment standpoint. I don't see any. So, you know, let's go ahead and wrap up. Thanks for joining me again this week. We are still um, in uncertain times, but the, the shoulder being um, 
one of the issues that, you know, new issues always come up, you know, like, like my shoulder uh, and whatever surgery and health issues people have, they come up every day. But I want you to know that no matter what challenges we face, we face them together. You know, I'm proud of Sunnyvale and how our residents have responded during the pandemic, you know, over the last few years, you know, I'm thankful for everyone who helps out in our community, showing their kindness, showing their generosity, showing their empathy. You know, your actions and your attitude really do make a difference. So Sunnyvale will emerge from this as a stronger community. We are in this together and we will get through this together. Have a good weekend. Take care. Goodbye.